you want to have a healthy economy and have real solutions, you have to have a healthy safety net. And the safety net needs to work to get people out of poverty. So my argument here is let's not focus on effort, on inputs, how much money we spend. Let's focus on outcomes. Are we actually getting people out of poverty? And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is to listen to people on the ground, the people who are fighting poverty person to person, and give them more flexibility in exchange for more accountability to actually get people out of poverty. We have learned good lessons about the right way to do this and not, and I would argue that we can customize a benefit to a person based on their particular needs, which actually helps them get out of poverty long term. Fair to say there is not a politician anywhere who would not want to be the one that came up with the perfect answer to solving poverty. And Wisconsin Congressman Paul Ryan is no exception, carefully preparing and then revealing his concept in a 73-page report. He calls it the Opportunity Grant. The reaction is not the opportunity he was likely looking for. Welcome to Midpoint, senior research fellow at the Mercatus Institute, adjunct professor of economics at George Mason University, where he specializes in economic freedom and growth. Matthew Mitchell joins us today. Matt, thanks so much for being here. Let's see if we got him. Okay, we don't have him, but we are going to go ahead and get him here in a moment. This allows me to tell you a little bit about what exactly Paul Ryan is thinking about here. He wants to beef up the earned income tax credit for childless workers. Now, this is a plan that many conservatives are not exactly going to like. Uh, he'd like to create something he calls Opportunity Grants, which I mentioned. It's a pilot initiative that transfers funding for 11 federal programs back to the states that sign up. So instead of applying to a bunch of different programs, as many people do, those in need would work with a single case manager on a customized, personalized, and streamlined plan to move into a job. Many people are looking at this and say he's wanting mentors here. Work requirements would count time spent in training or looking for employment. Most surprisingly, say reports, it would not cut current funding. So let's find out a little bit more about it. Matt, are you with us now? I am. There you go. Matt, thanks so much for joining us today. Sorry about the technical issues. No, no problem. Good, good to talk to you. Let's get what I mentioned here as opportunity grants. It is a pilot initiative that would transfer funding for 11 federal programs back to the states that sign up. He's talking about having a single caseworker, not applying to a bunch of different programs. In essence, it sounds like a good idea. Then why is he getting criticized? Yeah, so this is a, an idea that economists have talked about for a while. Is essentially that if you give people, if you set, set up an opportunity for states to compete and develop their own sorts of uh, anti-poverty programs, then you don't get locked into inefficient programs or programs that aren't uh, achieving what you're aiming to achieve. The other thing that uh, you know is a possibility here is that we have this very large grab bag of social programs something like 72 different different needs tested programs uh, and uh, one thing that economists have talked about for a while really going back to Milton Friedman is uh, the idea of taking all these programs and just turning them into one simple cash transfer uh, and I'm not sure if that's that's exactly what Paul Ryan is talking about but he's you know he's harkening back to this idea that economists have talked about for half a century which is rather than force people to buy particular products making uh, heating oil assistance or food or certain kinds of food or things like that, it's actually much more efficient to just give people a cash transfer and then you're more transparent about what you're trying to do as well. All right. Well, you mentioned 72 programs and that comes to mind right away. That sort of makes my, my ears stand up a little because with so many programs and knowing how slowly government works and how long it takes to get anything done, is it really possible to take 72 programs and put them down into one lump sum, if you will, and basically have everything done in, in a one-stop shop? Uh, well, there's obviously a lot of inertia with government, and um, each one of these programs has a concentrated special interest behind it, including the bureaucracy that administers it. So I'd imagine he's going to meet with a ton of political resistance just in, in, in um, just from the agencies themselves and trying to change the way they do business. Isn't it fair to say that when we come down and start talking about poverty, that people like Paul Ryan, Mitt Romney, others, whomever you want, I'm not just uh, hitting on the right here, but just about anybody, any politician, that there is still a major disconnect with most people who see politicians as being very wealthy, very well off, and simply not being able to understand what really goes on at the ground level? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you know, another major disconnect that I, I'd like people to 
appreciate is also that there's this big disconnect about what government actually does. I think there's a large perception among people that much of what government does is that it acts as a safety net. And um, you know, we might like that to be true, but it's not. It turns out that um, mo if you look at all the dollars that government spends, spends and all the redistribution that government does, oh, not much of it is actually safety net redistribution. A lot of it is distribution from one um, set of people to another, sometimes from low income people to high income. So a lot of regulations are what economists call regressive. Um, a lot of transfer programs are regressive. They, they transfer income, for example, Social Security and Medicare transfer income across generations um, from daughter's generation, my generation, my generation, my father's, um, but they, it's not a means-tested program. When we look at this, and there's a lot of people who are, again, I, I mentioned there's an awful lot of criticism on this, and one of them is, and I want you to comment on this, certainly as the economist here, that federal taxes and spending play a key role in stabilizing the economy nationally and regionally. Ryan recognizes the issue, but it simply won't work. You simply can't send all of this back to the states and expect them to be able to handle it fiscally. Now, right or wrong? Um, I mean, I, I, I think the states actually have a stronger rec fiscal record than the federal government does. Uh, of course, 49 out of 50 states have balanced budget requirements, and um, most of them meet this. Some of them uh, have some play some games with their budgets, but they've got a stronger record as far as uh, that goes. Uh, I think the states have a lot of benefits in that they're competing with one another, of course. Um, and the states have tended not to take on as, as many unfunded liabilities as the federal government has. So just in a lot of ways, um, the states typically seem more competent, actually, at, at handling fiscal matters than the federal government. How do you think that this gets looked at, though, when you look at the fact, and this again comes as a, uh, this comes from a story from Real Clear Politics, talking about not being able to trust the states, it says 24, 24 states that are depriving roughly 5 million Americans of health insurance because they refuse to participate in the Medicaid expansion of the Affordable Care Act. Isn't it safe to say that while we talked about trust a moment ago from Paul Ryan and others, that there are people who don't trust the states either? It doesn't make a difference where it's coming from, but there is no trust that the state is going to be able, going to, be able to get it done because it still is a big government issue. Sure. I mean, so one of the things teach is public choice economics, and that tells us to be skeptical about being centrist policy makers. Uh, if we think that people are rational and self-interested when they uh, interact in a marketplace, those same people, guess what? They're going to be rational and self-interested when they take a civil service exam and they run for office and when they vote or when they lobby. So um, we have to be skeptical of political processes, either at the state level or the federal level. The real key is to try to find, and this is Madison's uh, legacy, is to try to find, um, locate power where it's most responsive to the people and, and to be very skeptical about it and to try to fit different interests against, against one another checks and balances. Is this simply a way to get things away from the federal government? I mean, if you look at it from at the bottom of the day here, just take the, the responsibility, the federal responsibility for the poor away and just push it off on somebody else. That's how it seems to a lot of people. Um, you know, it, it may be. I mean, if you, if you want to look at it skeptically, it's uh, maybe we just doesn't want to have to deal with it. But uh, I think a more charitable view of it is trying to put it in the hands of governments that are more likely to be responsive to the people to introduce some measure of competition between governments. From a very economic stand, about a minute or so that I have left here, you're the economist, so we have to turn to you then to get some sort of answers here. It's a wonderful, wonderful proposal. It has a lot of questions. It has a few answers sitting in here right now. We've talked about some of the criticism here. Economics standpoint, though, if you wanted to start attacking the issue of poverty in this country, where do you start? So. Where I would start is first do no harm. So I'm the economist going to turn on the doctor. First do no harm. And there's a lot of things that the government does that stands in the way of One of the things here are licenses. So states across the country license crazy things from um, air, air grading to um, forests to interior decorators. All these barriers to entry into their businesses are barriers to progress and affordability. 1970, 10% of professionals license, now 30% of professionals. Uh, this is a big problem. I think both liberals and conservatives should be able to agree um, that first we ought to take away the barriers to the other than 
injury. Yeah, I like the terminology there and do no harm, which simply is, I think, what we're all looking for at any given time is at least try to find a way, if you're going to do this, to at least make sure that everybody gets a little something here and, and not hurt those who already are, already are in need. Matt Mitchell, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we will be in touch again, and I have a feeling that uh, we're going to be again because this isn't going to go away anytime soon. Thank you. All right, it's important to point out, too, that uh, Paul Ryan's role is changing. Uh, his term chairing the House Budget Committee is expiring, and he may become chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, which oversees tax policy, entitlement programs, and many of these other things. So there could be something of an idea here that perhaps this paves the way for something down the road for Congressman Ryan. Um, he's getting a lot of heat for this one. Later on this hour, why should anyone trust anything that is said by anyone connected with Hamas? You'll tell us a lot of what you think. We answer the questions because we question everything.